Like many French greats, the subject of today's video was born to two foreign parents, in this case, Italians who had fled after the World War I. During his teenage years, he would flirt with the prospect of joining Mets FC, first missing out on the opportunity due to injury and then after failing a medical test. With his dreams going down the drain, he would join Nancy, a club in which his father was a director. Quickly, he would be loved by the fans, getting a shot at the first team after scoring a hat-trick for the B team. But but as much as eventually he would become one of the most loved players in the world, he would end up as one of the most hated football figures to this day. Welcome to the ups and downs of a three-time Ballon d'Or winner and of football's greatest fallen angel, Michel Platini. In his first match for the first team, he would get sped on and hit by several objects thrown from the stands as the fight broke out. And then, in a match for the reserves, he would get injured severely and he wouldn't play a match for the first team until May, when he would get two goals against Leon. In the following year, he would finally become a regular starter for the first team, but once again bad luck would follow him and he would break his arm in two different places in a match against Nice and be out for the rest of the season as he would watch Nancy get relegated. The following season, Platini would demonstrate how valuable he could be, scoring 30 goals in 43 matches and helping Nancy get promoted easily, even knocking out reigning champion Saint Etienne from the French Cup with two goals coming from Platini's free kicks. Despite some more struggles with injuries and being recruited for military service, one of Platini's greatest displays would come the following season as he would score a hat-trick against Marseille despite being just 20 years old. The following season, after getting a really easy draw, Platini and his team would achieve the impossible, a spot at the final of the French Cup, and to win it, of course they had to beat Nice. As you might imagine, Platini stepped up and scored the only goal, getting himself his first ever trophy and earning himself a spot at the 1978 World Cup taking place in two weeks. The World Cup would be a disaster. Having beat Italy a few months earlier with a fantastic performance by Platini, the fans expected the same to happen this time. But since then, the Italians had conjured up a plan to stop him, and it would work out so perfectly that France would get knocked out in the group stage and Platini would get booed by the French for months to come, as they blamed him for his early exit. After one last season at Nancy, once again struggling with injury and missing out on the Cup Winners' Cup, Platini would see that many teams were prepared to welcome him into their squad, such was the case for Inter Milan and PSG. But Platini would pick Saint Etienne, spending three seasons there where his success would be relative to say the least. Winning one single trophy coming in the form of Ligue 1, he would see himself lose the final of the French Cup in his last two years. This would be a disappointment not only for himself but also for the team who signed him in hopes of winning an European Cup as they had reached its final in 1976. Further disappointment also came with his performances for the national team in that period as they failed to qualify for the 98 80 euros in favor of Czechoslovakia. After his final season with Saint Etienne, he would also take part in the 1984 World Cup in Spain, where despite the first match loss to England, they would still get through to the second group stage, where they would come out victorious and beat Poland in the quarterfinals before facing Germany in the semis. A match that would start with Platini getting a goal and come to a point where, eight, where 18 minutes before the end of the match, France led by two goals, only to see themselves draw and lose out on penalty. Penalties. To further embarrass themselves, they would lose their third place match against Poland, with only two first division trophies and no memorable awards to his name. At 27 years old, Platini could have turned out as one of those players who never saw his potential be truly fulfilled, but a move to Juventus would change everything. Partnering up with several of Italy's World Cup winning players, Platini was expected to make Juventus a nearly unbeatable team, but by winter, it would have been scrutinized so much by the media that it would come close to leaving Italy. By the end of January, Juventus had gone seven matches without a win. It was a desperate time, but Platini did not back down, demanding a change in tactics that he claimed would solve everything, and it surely came close to doing so, with Juventus only losing one more league match till the end of the season and making it to both the European Cup final and the Coppa Italia final, which would be played in two legs. With his two finals making up the decisive three last matches of his first season in Italy, a 1-0 defeat to Hamburg would shatter his European dreams, and a 2-0 defeat to Verona in the cup final seemed to be the final nail in the coffin. But the final second leg would become memorable, to say the least. 
Paolo Rossi would get the first goal, putting Juve one goal behind Verona and nine minutes before the end of the match, Platini would come and equalize. Perhaps there was a chance at salvation and that chance would manifest itself in extra time in the form of Platini's second goal, earning him his first trophy in Italy. The following season, Platini would get 15 goals in 16 consecutive matches, only failing to score in two of them. Around that same time, he would also win his first Ballon d'Or, which came to show how essential he was to Juve's recovery in the previous season. Being in such good form, he would lead Juve to his first Serie A title, only losing four times over that league season, but perhaps the most important aspect of that club season would come as Platini would take home his first international trophy in the form of a Cup Winners' Cup, where they had to face Manchester United, PSG and finally FC Porto in the final, before also taking home the European Super Cup with a win over Liverpool. But as much as that was his most successful club season to date, nothing could possibly outshine his performance during that summer's Euros. In the first match of the competition, he would get France's only goal over Denmark. Then, he would get a hat-trick against Belgium and another hat-trick against Yugoslavia to finish the group stage with seven goals already. Then, as they met Portugal in the semi-final, they would see themselves go into extra time in a one-goal draw that would be followed by a goal by each of the two teams maintaining that same draw, with the game only being truly unlocked in the final minutes of extra time by Platini himself, sealing their spot in the final. With an easy 2-0 win over Spain in the final, as Platini opened the score sheet, the final would be the match to remember, but still, Platini had scored in every match of the tournament, scoring 64% of France's goals. All of this becomes much more impressive, as you notice that this was Platini's only ever Euros. The man can truthfully claim to have scored in every match he ever took part in at the Euros. Despite only taking part in one tournament, Platini still manages to tie Cristiano Ronaldo for the most goals scored in the Euro's final stages. Having scored in all five matches he played also makes him the player with the most consecutive matches scored in at the Euros. He is also the player with the most braces in a single edition tied with Griezmann and Gerd Müller, as well as the only player with two hat-tricks in a single tournament, also being the oldest ever to score a hat-trick. Truly incredible how much of a legacy he built for himself in just five matches. The following year, he would have one hell of a season once again, with the European Cup's format allowing for a much higher degree of luck to be involved in the draw, Juventus would face Il Tampere, Grasshopper, Sparta Prague and Bordeaux as they made their way to the final, where a truly fit adversary would finally get in their way as they faced Liverpool. The only goal would be scored of course by none other than Michel Platini, as he earned not only his first European Cup trophy but also his spot as that year's top scorer. Platini should be entitled to remembering this match as the greatest moment of his career, but as you might know, this match coincided with the Eisel Stadium disaster. As kickoff was approached, Liverpool fans started throwing rocks and glass bottles to the next stand, where the Juventus fans tried to peacefully watch the match. As the throwing grew in intensity, the chaos began. As Juventus fans tried to escape, several got trampled and pushed against the wall. So much was a force which stood on that wall that eventually the stand collapsed, causing death to 39 Juventus fans as well as injuring around 600 people. The decision to proceed with the match has been criticized for decades. With Platini also being criticized for excessively celebrating the win, though he claims he was unaware of the extent of the disaster. In the following season, he would win the Intercontinental Cup, scoring in the final as well as another Serie A trophy and his final and third consecutive Ballon d'Or, the most anyone had ever won up till then. Over the summer, he would have his most successful World Cup season despite playing through injury, with France beating Belgium to the third place match after a defeat to Germany in a semi-final. This tournament would have been Platini's last Jura, as he looked somewhat tired over the last season of his career with the Juventus. By now you must be questioning yourself how he could end up as the most hated man in football, given that you are not aware of what happened already. 
Well, following his retirement, Platini took over as France's national team coach, getting a record 19 consecutive wins without a loss, only to step down from his role as coach after going down in the first round of elimination in the Euros despite being favourites to win it. After these events, more than a decade would go by, but in 2007, Platini would be named the new president of UEFA. This could have been an opportunity for Platini to give more to the sport than he had already, but instead, he chose to involve himself in the famous 2015 FIFA corruption case, where several FIFA and UEFA higher ups entered in a money laundering and racketeering scheme with several being imprisoned but Platini walking free. Perhaps this wasn't enough of a scare for him, as he would involve himself in another corruption case that saw Qatar be awarded as hosts of the 2022 World Cup, despite being completely unfit for the job. The previous World Cup host role's attribution to Russia has also been put into question. Regardless, this time he could not escape, being imprisoned in 2019, despite later being released, he is still forbidden from taking part in any football-related activities until 2023. Platini entertained the world with his grace and his touch only to defeat all that he stood for after his retirement. As he looks like football's prodigal son, he claims he can prove his innocence to much disbelief from everyone else. Perhaps one day he will truly return. Still, putting all of this to the side, he was one of the best we've ever seen. Though unlucky in several points of his career, he surely made his name one of the greatest and most respected in football. Getting into our ranking system, he will be first judged on his finishing. He was a fine finisher with impressive free kicks and very prolific. It's an 8 out of 10. When it comes to playmaking, it's a straight 10 out of 10 with no discussion whatsoever. In terms of dribbling, I think it's also that simple, another 10 out of 10. In terms of speed and physicality, it's easily the worst part of his game. He was very criticized for having poor stamina, he got injured frequently, had a poor work rate defensively, and was not imposing at all. It's a 5 out of 10. Lastly is mentality. He was exceptionally good at reading the game, very disciplined and a great leader. It's another 10 out of 10. Then his legacy. First, consistency. He was always great at every stage and always came out as a winner, but he did struggle to get there frequently. It's a 9 out of 10. He was one of those players with the purest, silkiest touch. Flair is also easily a 10 out of 10. His trophy cabinet is a mixed bag. Only 12 trophies is immensely disappointing, but with 3 Ballon d'Ors and nearly one of each major trophy, except for the World Cup, it's easily a 9 out of 10. Only playing 15 seasons, with only around 7 of them coming at the highest level, his longevity is only a 6 out of 10. The last attribute is the icon factor. He's one of the greats and everyone knows it, but his post-retirement career massively impacted his legacy. And now people literally put him to the side with some nearly pretending he doesn't exist. That knocks him down 1 point and earns him a 9 out of 10. This totals out at 86 out of 100, making him the 4th best player we've ever reviewed, tied with Zico and Maldini and only behind Eusebio, Puskas and Cruyff. It's a damn shame to be honest, like, he could have kept his legacy at such a high level and be remembered so fondly by everyone, but well, everyone has to choose their path in life and I guess that's what he chose for himself, so yeah. This is Platini's career in a video I hope you enjoyed, if you did don't forget to like and subscribe, and yeah, see you next time.